let's talk about this piece that I know is coming out soon in uh, Rolling Stone because next issue, next issue. Um, it, it <clears throat> you know the. Uh, sort of like the 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 dudes uh, and the uh, the arms dealers, and folks have not heard the the story behind that. Um, we've spoken about that story, I think, a couple of times. Yeah, uh, and it's the story grew. You know, there there's the the sort of the uh, the I guess the sort of the melodrama of two 18 year olds essentially becoming the largest uh, um, small arms dealers in the history of the United States of the universe. I think that's a universe. Um, and then <clears throat> there's the whole other story that I think as you, as you expand in the book about the U S government really just using these guys or uh, being right. aware of uh, that uh, supposedly they were getting uh, just being aware of, of yeah. what they so were doing. What you have is you have like this, you know, so the United States government decides to torture, right? And so who, who's, whose fault is that? That's Lindy English. It's not George Bush's or Donald Rumsfeld. Right. Uh, the United States government decides to spy domestically and s soak up all your emails, all your phone calls, everything uh, that is you would assume to be private. And, of course, it's, that's all Ed Snowden's fault. Uh, then in Iraq, they start to kill civilians. The United States military starts to kill civilians, and that's all Chelsea Manning's fault, right? Like, there's a pattern here. Like, these, these young, defenseless, essentially fall guys or scapegoats are, are supposed to personify these massive changes in policy. And, and that was true for the arms dealing story. You know, essentially, the United States government, after it invaded Iraq and Afghanistan, realized that it needed to create armies, and in order to do that, they needed to get a whole ton of uh, uh, weapons into these places to stand up these armies in Iraq and Afghanistan. And in order to do that, they needed to buy a whole boatload of this stuff from the former Soviet countries, which is essentially the Balkans, um, because they banned the Chinese and the Russian in a, in a crazy sort of fit of peak. Anyway, the point is, is that they couldn't go do it themselves. They couldn't send jarheads into Albania to buy these weapons. They needed private contractors because private contractors give you this beautiful thing called plausible deniability, right? It gives you a scrim. You're not the one paying the bribes. You're not the one, you know, dealing with gun runners and people who are known to be selling arms to African warlords. You've got these private contractors, and that's what the kids were. They were like online gamblers, but they were gambling with, you know, arms contracts. So that was that story, and, and they, they became the scapegoats, of course, front page of the New York Times. Like, whose fault is it? It's two kids. And no, nobody stopping to say, well, hey, man, what about the emperor? What, what's the emperor wearing here? Did the Pentagon really not know what was going on here? Did the Pentagon <laughs> really have no clue what it was getting? And then, of course, you know, Sam, as you read the book, you'll see that what the net result of this is, and this is whenever I say this to somebody who's experienced with the um, federal government, the federal government, they just laugh because this just so makes perfect sense, is the United States government set out to break the law. And then the United States government's law enforcement agency set out to stop it from breaking the law. <laughs> and the result was they screwed up the policy, which is they stopped getting the weapons to the Afghans. Right. You know, so you wind up with basically a cluster. You know the word. Yeah, no, I definitely know the uh, word. And, and it winds up with the kids in prison. You know, like that's that's that solves everything. Woo. <laughs> And 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 we should say too, uh, the, you know, part of that story is also sort of the, and I know, you know, sort of, I guess, part of the backstory there is also the failure of that story to be reported, yeah. which is, a, 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 you know, I mean, the like you say, the times were on it, and that part of the story was uh, not reported. Uh, we're going to see it in your book, but yeah, uh, that's a pretty, I mean. You know, that's sort of what we all sort of expect the Times to do right, right? I mean, is... Uh, is well, I mean, I, you, know, I, you know, hey, man, I'm, I'm writing for the Times, and I think it's an incredibly important and powerful instrument in our society. But, you know, it's also, you know, a, a, a part of the establishment, and it doesn't get held to, to account. You know, I mean, how often do, do you see people able to talk back to the New York Times? And that was maybe the best fun of writing the book was being able to quote these kids pointing out exactly the ways that New York Times got the story wrong. Right. I mean, how often do you get to do that? 
Uh, you know, me? not that I much. Mean, yes, that's true, uh, and particularly in terms of uh, of reporting. Well, all yeah. right, so let's talk about this this story uh, that you have. I don't know what it's going to be titled, but it's about— The Dukes of Oxy, I think. <laughs> the, uh, the, so these guys—tell us the story, because this has that also that same element, too, where— um, you, uh, it does, yeah. An totally. environment is created where these guys could actually do what they're doing, and— the, the story that's going to get uh, told primarily is the story about these guys, right? I mean, right. I imagine but the bigger the, story by far is the, is the corporate one, right? Yeah, exactly. And that's what it, it, that's what struck me about it. Uh, although it's also an amazing sort of, I don't know, good fella, good fellas ish <laughs> type of story. So tell us about yeah. Dodd and uh, yeah, basically the little these, general. <laughs> <laughs> you have these kids. How the story comes to me is maybe interesting just to frame it up a little bit is that prisoners pitch me stories from time to time, you know, kind of regularly. And some prisoners uh, sort of become like these jailhouse writers and pitch me stories about other prisoners. So one of the way it came to me was one of these jailhouse writers hooked up with one of these kids who was in prison doing time for the story I'll describe in a second. And so I read the manuscript. They'd written this thing, and, you know, I I don't have any, you know, it it wasn't the easiest read, you know. Uh, Right. But it contained like a kernel of something interesting, and so I began to communicate with, with the, the, the main guy, who's this guy, Doug Dodd. And essentially, this is the story. He's like a kid in Hudson, Florida, which is like a redneck suburb, exurb of Tampa. He's on the wrestling team. You know, his parents are divorced. They live in trailers. He's, you know, they're driving around and sort of pick up trucks and smoking dope. And he's a little bit of a, he's a dope dealer in high school and a sort of a muscle bound, short wrestler guy. And, uh, he gets caught smoking weed on the way home one day from school or from work and gets put on probation. And part of the probation means you have to go home after school and that he gets bored and he's got this cousin who's depressed or whatever. And this cousin says, Hey, try this. And he gives him a Roxy codone, which is a kind of painkiller that if you crush it up and snort it becomes what they call hillbilly heroin, right? This is the Oxy and Roxy plague of America. Essentially it's a pain as a severe pain medication invented hundred years ago to, to treat people in war that has been repurposed by the United States pharmaceutical industry into this multi, multi billion dollar, uh, pain, pain pill, uh, industry. So the kid, you know, he starts to snort it every day and, uh, starts to share it with his friends because in Florida, this drug is ubiquitous and here's why. And here's where the sort of what you talked about, the, the, the corporate kind of element of it is Florida in the, in the state, I just want your listeners to sit down for a second and listen to this, because this is a true fact. This is one of the most amazing facts I've ever come across in all my reporting life. The state of Florida in 2008 issued 10 times more pain pill medication prescriptions than the rest of the United States combined. 10 times more than the rest of the United States combined. So... Say the rest of the United States issued $100 million, 100 million pills, pain pills for various maladies and and surgical procedure, post-surgical procedures. That would be like they did, Florida did a billion alone. It's just, it's just, the mind boggles. So now, now, wait a second. Now, 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 to a certain extent, one would anticipate that Florida would probably on a per capita basis have more because older people, right? Uh, and, yeah, 10 times more than all of the rest of the United States combined. Right. So in other words, there's not more um, uh, people over the age of 55 playing golf and want to sort of loosen up uh, in Florida than the <laughs> entire rest of the country. Well, so, you know, the economics of it, are, it's, it's a little like the arms dealing thing in a simple sense. Like, So the government in the arms thing essentially said, get us the cheapest ammo you can. So what do you wind up with? Cheap ammo. In this case... The Florida state government refused to have any registry of, uh, uh, of, uh, to track the number of prescriptions patients had, uh, supposedly on the basis of uh, privacy, right? Right, because it's un-American for the government to get involved in that type of thing. To know what, how many prescriptions you have. But, of course, that just meant that people would get dozens of prescriptions, and they'd start selling their pills. So you have all these um, pillbillies, they call them, you know, along the Redneck Riviera, taking this, this hillbilly heroin and then monetizing it. So what it created was a marketplace in Florida where uh, the street value of an oxycodone pill was like eight bucks, and in the rest of the country it was 50. Right? 
And, and so these, this, this 18 year old kid and his buddies are sitting there one day at the beach getting wasted on these pills. And one of their brothers says, Hey man, you know, these things go for 50 bucks up in Tennessee. And the kids go, really? No shit. Excuse my language. And, and the next thing you know, they ship up a 500 pills to see what happens. They say sell out in one day, they ship a thousand, they sell out in one day. And all of a sudden they've got, they're, they're shipping thousands of pills, 20,000 pills a month up from, from Florida, where it's essentially uh, legal, meaning to say that trading in these drugs is so ubiquitous and the, and the supply is so huge uh, into Tennessee. So they're, they're feeding basically college kids and wrestling teams up in Tennessee, these, these pill, pain pills, and they're making millions of dollars and they're 18 years old. Wow. It's sort of like a, if you wanted to remake Smokey and the Bandit, I guess that's what it would be, right? Because that's isn't the that Dukes of the Dukes where, of where they brought the cigarettes like from one place that had low taxes to another or something? Yeah, 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 yeah. It's, it's, it's an arbitrage. The funny thing was is that the kids had the realization they were sitting in their community college business 101 class, and they're like, do you realize what we could do? Well, that's so, the that's the amazing thing about the the, the story. You have one ki- kid who's sort of out of control, and then the yeah. other one who's like, "I'm just going to get a small stake here." And uh, the little and, general, I just got an email from him this morning. He's doing 15 years. You know, yeah. I mean, so what happens, of course, is the kids get addicted to the drug, right? And they get addicted to the money and the girls and the fast life and the and the you know the pickup trucks, the late model, the new red pickup truck, all of it. It's like it's. It, it is smoking the bandit or the Dukes of hazard. You know, it's like they're living the dream. And you know, the larger story that they're involved in is of course, these health companies that are manufacturing these pills are profiting from this. They know that there's no conceivable way that the amount of pills that they're manufacturing relate to the actual demand for legitimate pain prescriptions that, you know, so there's a company called Cardinal health insurance that, uh, that supplies, essentially the Southeast and they're, they're banned by the DEA finally. So in Mexico, when they want to run drugs, you know, (laughs) they have to build tunnels and submarines. And I've written about that over the years, the Mexican drug wars. And in the United States, these, these, these were basically the Mexican cartels, but they were fortune 500 companies and they didn't have to do anything. They just had to manufacture the pills. And then the doctors would benefit from the, uh, you know, all these different, uh, incentive schemes they have for writing prescriptions and just the money they get from churning people through their office. I mean, the, when Doug Dodd got his own pain prescription by faking a back injury and twisting his back for the MRI, um, his, 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 uh, his meeting with the doctor took 30 seconds. Right. And probably yeah, cost a couple hundred bucks and it was perfectly fine from his perspective because that's, that's a drop in the bucket. Yeah, I mean, you know, his, his legitimate doctor, he went to see his, his actual doctor to try to, with this MRI r- report, and his, his legitimate doctor said, no, I'm not giving you that. That stuff's dangerous. You do not want to start messing with oxycodone. So he just went to what, what they call pill mills. He just went to a joint that was called like pain is us or pain are us or something like that. <laughs> and it's just a doctor sitting there all day, this desiccated doctor just writing 400 paying prescriptions a day and making, you know, 600,000 bucks a year doing it. And the amazing thing about that Cardinal Health is that at one point, you write, the DEA, DEA realized, like, they are just overproducing. There's just no way right. uh, they don't know that they are producing more than could be possibly consumed legally. Right, so they put, they put everyone in jail, right? They, they, they go to the source and they solve the problem. Isn't that what happens, Sam? Right, almost. <laughs> almost. They basically <laughs> just said, hey, you should be paying a little bit more of a tax, essentially. Right, right, exactly. And, and so for a couple of weeks, there's a slowdown in business. They, they, we should tell me, they, they suspended the production, which the guys felt on the street, apparently, right? Yeah, yeah, they, well, on the street, no, they, it's, they felt it, the street in this case is CVS. Right. They go that's, into CVS. That's your street Well, corner. explain that's, that that's to your, people. Explain that to people, because that's sort of... The, the, you know, the place, if you want to score heroin, you know, you probably have to go to some questionable neighborhood or deal with some questionable people. Uh, if you want to get, like, a, you know, industrial-sized amounts of pot or cocaine, or meth, you know, watch Breaking Bad. Like, you just, you wind up having to deal with, with people who are criminals. In, in the case of prescription pain medications, which 
are just as just as dangerous, if not more so, and just as addictive, if not more so, you need to go to the CVS or the Walgreens. And you need to, you know, tell that nice the Nigerian young man with the with the pharmacist tag on his lapel, well, you know, here's my prescription. <laughs> it's it's crazy because I mean it, it literally is heroin, you know, and and so these kids were were you know caught up in a in a in a kind of cultural phenomena where they were you know the criminals, but the whole scenario, of course, was just aimed towards that. Right. And they go there. There's a, a, a dearth for a while, and the company just pays what they pay thirty four million dollars, which sounds like a lot, but it's probably a drop in the bucket over the course of five years of of, of pumping this stuff out. I don't think it will be a drop in the bu- bucket, Sam. I think there'd be a lot less than that. You know, I mean, thirty four million dollars. I mean, this is a multi billion dollar industry. You know, the kids, these eighteen year olds, were making millions of bucks. Right. So you tell me what the system was, was yielding. And, you know, <clears throat> the solution, like not to be like Mr., you know, hold that, you know, hold the light up and judge everybody. I mean, but the, the answer to this is like so transparently obvious. It's, it just involves some simple things like, for example, having a register, you know, informing doctors of the risk, making sure that doctors are monitored to see if they're not writing too many scripts. Just like simple, basic stuff. You know, the, the rest of the country was doing. The irony about it all was is that the more, um, <clears throat> the more uh, uh, regulatory, regulatory schemes were effective, the higher the price on the street uh, for the illegal Oxy and Roxy. So these kids started shipping it to Tennessee, and then this one guy says, hey, man, you should see how much this costs in Alaska. Right. So then they start shipping to Alaska, and, and, then, and then South Carolina, and then New York. So, you know, they, they were becoming Scarfaces. And as you say, the dynamic was one of the kids, Doug Dodd, sort of came from a family of hardened drug dealers. So he was you know, acutely aware of the risks they were taking. The other kid came from more of the other sort of ringleader kid, the little general, came from more of a middle class family. So he, he just was more brazen. You know, he, he was the kind of kid who bought an assault rifle. <laughs> I mean, it's not funny, but he, he bought an assault rifle with a laser and he used to sit outside on the deck of his, you know, high end luxury loft in Tampa Bay and at nighttime and getting wasted and point the laser at the foreheads of people walking along the street, you know, for fun. So well, yeah, it's it's uh, you know, there's no way to do that. What does that guy dream. say? What does that guy say now? I mean, what does that guy now that he's in prison, like is he like You want what? me to read an email from him today? I could probably do that for you right sure. now. Sure. I mean, he's, <laughs> I mean, because I'm, this is going in the story, and we're doing the fact check. As you can imagine, Rolling Stone is being very careful about its fact checks this week. Yes, indeed. <laughs> so, I, I mean, if people have followed that at all, it's, uh, you know, the whole Virginia story has been a real tough one for the magazine. It's, my experience, just on that note, if anyone's following it, is, is that they've always been very thorough. You know, it's interesting. There was two things that 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 uh, occurred to me as I'm reading your piece. Is that is that the, that they one? It's about how they sort of faked their pain uh, and their problems with the MRI. And I'm talking to a guy today that uh, we're we're pre-recording for for uh, the next week when we're on vacation uh, about a guy who who talks about the politics of pain. And then the other thing that occurs to me is too, is that we've had, um, both, I think Carl Hart and, uh, Johan Hari on this program who, um, who have a, a, a different theory, uh, about, um, I think sort of how one controls, uh, drugs and the, a different theory about the, addictive qualities of these drugs on some level and yeah. you know the the idea that when it was readily accessible you had far more abuse of these type of drugs now it's also hard to measure because these guys are shipping them outside of the state right and so right. You, you can't really get a per capita notion but right. um that um that the abuse of these drugs is a function uh, less of sort of controls and more of sort of the, the, the I guess, the, the state of individuals. Um, I, I've never been on them, but I've heard that they are 
I had a friend just went had some surgery, and coming off him apparently is no easy ride. Hmm. I mean, that's that's also what I have heard on some level too. And but I guess the question is, do you have the social context in which to be able to do that? Right. I mean, one guy was able to do it because he was just sort of acutely aware. Uh, one guy, the the story, the Dodd guy, was acutely yeah. aware of like I have to. Oddly enough, because he came from a family of people who had drug problems and had, yeah, I guess, gone to jail, yeah. he was sort of more conscious of the costs of this. The risks, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I think that it's, it's, you know, if you're, you know, what what you're talking about, kind of, I think, on some level, is is you know, the moral imagination. Like, so these things are legal and they're illegal. That's sort of a dissonant thing, right? Right. They're they're acceptable and they're unacceptable. And how do you draw lines? <laughs> and 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 the kids, I think, just were, especially like the you know the, the young guys that were doing this, were, were oblivious to those lines. I mean, they were aware they were breaking the law. I mean, you know, they, they were so dopey, like they didn't, like when you say the word interstate to somebody, you know, <clears throat> I think most people would understand that means federal. Right. But these kids were like, hey, we can do this interstate, no problem, without thinking, well, that might have consequences, you know. Uh, so you know, I think that a lot of it is to do with. Uh, is to do with um, technology and medicine being ahead of where we are kind of culturally. Right. All right, and, we'll read that story, because I'm, I'm uh, that email from uh, the little Yeah, general. I just was pulling it up. I mean, it, you know, he rambles. It, it, you know, he's like, hey, man, yeah, yeah, I did that. He's, he, he, it, <laughs> uh, here we go. Uh, here we go. He's just saying, uh, yes, I was crazy, and I used to point the laser off my balcony and everything, and yes, sometimes... Too, but it was never loaded. I was crazy, but not stupid. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. That's a fairly uh, he representative. He says from uh, while serving um, sixteen minutes, uh, sixteen years, I guess, in prison. Yeah, fifteen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, definitely, <clears throat> definitely, uh, he got the short end of the stick. And the reason he got the big time, apart from the fact that he was the ringleader, was <clears throat> that he didn't go first. He they, he got ratted out by one of his colleagues so i mean just as a piece of advice for any of your listeners out there who are involved in major internet uh, major uh, criminal conspiracies you know be sure to be the one that goes to the law enforcement first right at the end you all end up in the same place is that the idea no the idea is is you if you cooperate first you will not go to prison oh at all but didn't all these guys go no not the guy who ratted them out he's a car salesman in tennessee and 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 the <laughs> other guy is also out of prison now too. Yeah, right? well, he, he did his spin. He did five. Wow. But the, the the guy who went first, the guy who snitched, who you know who got caught with some pot, and then basically the DEA came in and said we're going to make it federal, and his lawyer said make a deal. Uh, he's out and about. Wow. Yeah. So you know it's it, it's there's a lot of politics to law enforcement issues. 